That's messed up. And they would dump their bodies in the moors. So um, that was about 40 years prior to this. So hooray, there's a new serial killer on the loose and he's a doctor. No hate on Britain, but like, (laughs) does anyone else find the crimes that occur in Britain like extra creepy? A little bit. Yeah. It's kind of nuts. Like, is it just because of the weather, do you think? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, uh, that's a good theory because Canada's kind of got the same. They just need some sunshine. (laughs) They need vitamin D. Murder. Hello, all of you true crime fans and healthcare professionals that are hopefully not doing what we are discussing in this podcast. I am Ashley, a brand specialist, and here with me is Alicia. What's up? What's up? Um, and happy October. Happy October. This is my favorite month. Heck yeah. It is the most bipolar of the months. It goes from nice, nice to cold and maybe snowy here in nebraska you Mm -hmm. never know Mm -hmm. yep you can wear shorts at the beginning of october and then by the end of october you might wear a winter coat underneath your halloween costume oh that's the worst so this first episode of healthcare horrors we're going to talk about mr harold shipman aka dr death he dabbled in forgery and abused opioids and you know decided to start murdering a lot of his female patients, but we will get to that in a little bit. Harold Fred Shipman was born January 14th, 1946 in Nottingham. He was the middle of three siblings, and his first intro to being around sickness came from his mom, who actually had lung cancer and His mom adored him. She called him Freddy. Um, He took care of her, and her name was Vera. She was 43 when she passed away, and Fred was 17 at the time. So in 1970, he actually graduated from Leeds University, where he was studying medicine. He got married. He had at least two kids. At least? Yeah. At I, least two kids? At least two kids. I'm not really sure <laughs> if he had like more down the road. Unspecified. Oh, okay. We didn't introduce you. Do we need to introduce No, you? everybody knows me. <laughs> That's Dolan. <laughs> By the way, Dolan is over there producing this hot mess of a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> After an internship and proving to be a worthy general practitioner, Shipman would soon start showing his true colors. He was usually very well respected and liked, but he sounded to be like a little bit of a brat. Like if he didn't get his way, he was kind of arrogant and... Same. I'm a brat (laughs) when I don't get my way. (laughs) Maybe it's because he was like his favorite by his mom. I don't really know. I don't think the middle child, speaking from experience, is ever the favorite. (laughs) I think that's a myth. Uh, Yeah, could be. I'm an only child, so I don't know. I don't know. My brother, he's a middle child and he gets everything. He mm-hmm. gets away with everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's my little brother. He gets away with everything. He gets everything. Mm. It's it's the baby of the family. Mm-hmm. You're an automatic favorite, Ashley. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, rude and insulting. If he didn't get his way, he was kind of arrogant. He would make everyone feel stupid. Basically, he would call them stupid. And, um, what other a meanie. Than that, yeah. But he was, like, liked by his patients and stuff. He knows how to turn on that charm. He's got that bedside manner. (laughs) Uh, After only two years of being a general practitioner at Todd Morden, uh, it was discovered that he was addicted to pethidine. What's pethidine? So it's similar to morphine, but it's usually used in um, like labor and delivery to help mothers give birth. I don't think they gave me that when I was um, <laughs> in labor. Well, you know, it, next time maybe ask for I think some maybe not. Time. I don't know. I'm kind of scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this kind of led to his first downfall, I guess. He would write fake prescriptions for his patients. So he had access to 
all of this pethidine, the reason he did get found out initially was because he was taking so much pethidine that he like started having blackouts. So was he, I have a question. Yes. Was he writing the fake prescriptions for himself or for his patients? He, He was writing them for his patients, but he was getting it. Is, like, were they that, giving, like, so was he taking it to the pharmacy and, like, being like, oh, Sally May needs X maybe. amount of pethidine. And then he's just, like, taking the pethidine for himself. That sounds right. Interesting. That sounds like how that would go. What I a guess. stand-up guy. I'm not really sure how it would go back in those days. No security checks. <laughs> no security checks. You're a doctor. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Fraudulent prescriptions. Um, and so, yeah, he was having blackouts. Um, he tried passing it off as epilepsy and let's see i have it okay so i have it written down how much he was taking so 100 milligrams is a normal dose of pethidine he was taking six to seven hundred milligrams a day oof basically you know i guess with any drug you start taking so much and you're not really taking it for the thrill of it anymore you're taking it to prevent withdrawals to prevent the blackouts so that man had quite a tolerance (laughs) yeah he he definitely built up quite a tolerance oh hey i found another note his wife's name was primrose and he had four children oh so not two dolan four i'm sorry i'm going all over are these okay is it is it (laughs) unspecified because of the lack of information out there on the internet or is it unspecified because he was just blacking out so much <laughs> on this stuff that that he could have children out there that he doesn't know about? Um, I think I got some different numbers from different sources. So oh, okay. I like Dolan's ladder theory. <laughs> so once he was found out about these fraudulent prescriptions and his opioid addiction, the General Medical Council fined him and banned him from working with drugs until 1977, which it kind of sounds like they just gave him a little slap on the wrist. They fined him like 600 pounds. And at the time, I'm not sure how much that would be in like US dollar amount. So he obviously had to stop being a general practitioner for a while. And once his, you know, timeout was over, he reemerged as a general practitioner in Hyde. And kind of a fun fact about Hyde Hyde was near Manchester, England, and that is actually where the Moores murders took place. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of those. They were serial killers, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, and they killed children. That's messed up. And they would dump their bodies in the Moors. So um, that was about 40 years prior to this. So hooray, there's a new serial killer on the loose, and he's a doctor. No hate on Britain, but like, (laughs) does anyone else find the crimes that occur in Britain like extra creepy? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. It's kind of nuts. Like, is it just because of the weather, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that's a good theory because Canada's kind of got the same. They just need some sunshine. <laughs> they need vitamin D. Nineteen ninety two, he decided to start his own practice. Um, Prior to starting his own practice, though, he was killing people. So, uh, yes, this killing was going on for a while. Yeah, so I'll let you dive into that fun, fun part of his life. Okay, Mr. Harold Shipman. So, I'm gonna kind of start, I'm gonna kind of work my way backwards. So, in 2005, an official report found that Harold Shipman had killed an estimated 250 people beginning in 1971 crazy yeah that's a lot of people so many people and that's just an estimation oh my goodness Mm -hmm. um in most cases shipman injected the victim with a lethal dose of a painkiller called diamorphine and then signed a death certificate attributing the incident to natural causes his motives were unclear um some speculated that he was seeking to avenge the death of his mother and as you said she had um, what lung cancer yep Others thought that he was just practicing euthanasia. And another possibility was that he was playing God. Most of his victims were normally healthy before they met him. 
So none of them had any severe um, health issues, concerns. They're just going to Dr. Harold Shipman as like their primary physician for like, here's a checkup. Like, what's going on with me? It was also kind of common in that time to to have doctors go to your house and do random checkups. And, you know, a lot of his his patients and victims were elderly. Um, So that also ties in to the forgery that he would, you know, he would kill them. And then he would alter their their death record or their like their health records, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he would like say they died of reasons such as diabetes, pneumonia, heart failure, heart disease, a stroke, a tumor in the brain, coronary thrombosis. I said that wrong. Oh my god. Coronary. 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 <laughs> I watched enough Grey's Anatomy out. to know that. the medical terms. Um yeah, or emphysema or just old age. And that's how and that's how he actually finally gets caught. Mm-hmm. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. But <laughs> um it was actually the local undertaker that was the one who noticed that Dr. Shipman's patients seemed to be dying at an unusually high rate. Um, and they all exhibited similar poses in death. And he actually approached Shipman um, himself, who assured him that there was nothing to be concerned about. Nothing weird going on here at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, he was such a charming guy, and everyone liked him at first. So it was easy for him to get away with this. Please know this is why I do not trust charming people. Yeah. <laughs> if you're too nice, something's wrong with you. Something's up. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, later on, a colleague, Dr. Susan Booth noticed the disturbing similarities and the local coroner's office was alerted and the police were contacted. Um, The police were unable to find sufficient evidence to bring charges against Dr. Harold Shipman, and this was later blamed on inexperienced officers conducting the investigations, which I feel like we hear that a lot in so many true crime stories. It's just like the, you know, police department was underfunded or like they just didn't have the training or experience or the manpower and So often that's how these crimes just Mm -hmm. go under the radar for so long. Yeah. The police abandoned the investigation in April of 1998 while Harold Shipman killed three more people before he was finally arrested. His last victim was Kathleen Grundy, who was 81 years old, and she was found dead in her home on June 24th of 1998. Shipman was the last person to see Kathleen alive, and he signed her death certificate and cited old age as her cause of death. Now, Kathleen's daughter was a lawyer. Her name is Angela Woodruff, and she was notified about a will that was allegedly created by her mom, and she thought this was kind of odd because she and her children were left out of this will. And the will was leaving Harold Shipman 386,000 pounds, which however much money that is in American dollars, I have no idea. But it seems like a lot of money, right? Yes. So it's probably her entire life savings. Mm -hmm. So which, I mean, so he's probably just sitting at her house, like caring for her and like talking with her, like how much money do you have? You know, like this having these intimate conversations Mm -hmm. with her and ultimately he's totally just going to kill her after he gains her trust. So Angela, her daughter, went to the police who opened an investigation again And they exhumed Kathleen's body to perform an autopsy. And they found traces of dimorphine. So Dr. Harold Shipman was arrested on September 7th of 1998. And he actually owned the typewriter that was used to forge Kathleen's will. Mm -hmm. Guilty. There's a lot of evidence against him. Like there was no way he was going to get out of it. I feel like the problem with so many serial killers and like criminals as they think they're smarter than everyone else don't you think like you'd get rid of the thing you used to like Mm -hmm. forge the will (laughs) maybe maybe. but it's it's like a power move most times isn't it like they're not going to catch me and i can even leave this as a clue it's true or maybe they want to get caught i don't know yeah what is that what is the psyche it's the thrill right (laughs) of being chased being just go smarter ri- than the other person. Go ride a freaking roller coaster if you want a <laughs> thrill. Watch a scary movie. Oh, my God. So at trial in October of 1999, um, Harold Shipman was charged with the murders of Marie West, Irene Turner, Lizzie Adams, Jean Lilly, 
Ivy Lomas, Muriel Grimshaw, Marie Quinn, Kathleen Wagstaff, Blanca Pomfret, Nora Nuttall, Pamela Hillier, Maureen Ward, Winifred Meller, John Malias, and Kathleen Grundy, all of whom died between 1995 and 1998. Oh, yes. Three years. He was just killing people. Yeah, yeah, he Like was. every other month. <laughs> and I'm really glad that you, even though he, you know, killed over 200 people, that's all that he was specifically charged for. And, you know, he was given a life sentence for each one of the victims. But I'm glad you read off their names because it is important to remember them versus the serial killer, too. So 100%. Um, on January 31st of 2000, after six days of deliberations, the jury found Shipman guilty of killing all 15 of those patients by lethal injections of diamorphine and forging the will of Kathleen Grundy. Shipman consistently denied his guilt and he never made any statements about his actions. I feel like that is the most frustrating part um, when criminals like commit these heinous acts and then just give you nothing. Like you're already caught. Mm-hmm. Just give it up. Then Dr. Harold Shipman hung himself in his jail cell on January 13th of 2004 on the eve of his 58th birthday. Um, he hanged himself from the window bars of his prison cell using bed sheets. There's a memorial to Shipman's victims called the Garden of Tranquility, which opened in Hyde Park on July 30th of 2005. And that, that is what I've got on Harold Shipman. A lot of people think it's because of his mother and he watched her slowly slip away. So giving his patients diamorphine or morphine. Like, he watched them slowly slip away. I was reading about a thing called exposure therapy, and it's a way to cope with something by reliving that trauma. So he was just, like, constantly reliving it and putting himself back in those situations, which is interesting. Um, Maybe he just hated women. He did kill a few men, but it was primarily women. It's it's hard to say. I think that... (laughs) maybe he found women were more trusting and also if like they were going to put up a fight he could totally take them versus if he was Mm -hmm. to you know come sideways at a man Mm -hmm. so were these like one-time injections of this like Mm -hmm. so it wasn't like uh injected this person they didn't die and then they like came back to him for more medical health it Mm -mm. was all so that was it they came to him and they died yeah yeah one and done all these healthy people yeah, all these healthy people. And, you know, when you, I guess, when you inject someone into the vein, like you can tell when they've had enough because of how quickly it reacts with the body, but he would just purposely overdose them and it would take care of it. Um, he would stage them so they would look peaceful when they died. So um, I'm just going to say, I think that Dr. Harold Shipman really needed a therapist. A little bit. I think a lot of the people that we're about to talk about should have had therapists. Talk therapy, man. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Could solve a lot of problems and prevent a lot of crazy things. So I wonder if there's anything out there like where the the children speak up because he got caught recently. I mean, in terms of when he started doing the crimes, right? Like this, you said this was going on for almost twenty years. So since 1971. Yeah. So even longer than that. Yeah. yeah. Over 20 years. And it was 2004 when he killed himself. How, like, mentally, like, if that was your dad, like, what would you think? Like, what would you do? Like, would you be okay? Yes. Or would you just change your name and never tell anybody? I would probably go that route. In pictures, he looks so sweet. Like, he looks like a super sweet old grandpa. It's Never those people. judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Even if it looks really nice, <laughs> like a sweet old grandpa. I got some of my information from the book by Robert Keller called Medical Monsters, and I listened to the Medical Murders podcast, um, found a cool magazine in the grocery store called Crimes That Shocked the World, and there was a little spread on him. What about you? You said you found a really cool website. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. So I use <laughs> Britannica.com, which is, you know, not the cool website, but very informational, very informative. <laughs> I also used Biography.com, and then I used Murderpedia.com. Murderpedia is like, it's legit. It's got a lot of good information on there. So on that note, next week, we are going to talk about Walter Jackson Freeman II. Walter Jackson Freeman II is most known for lobotomy. Mm-hmm. Tasty. tasty and don't do anything dr harold shipman would do don't do drugs don't commit murders be nice to people like legitimately nice to them i like that not just to kill them boom happy october (laughs) thank you for listening to healthcare horrors brought to you by atlas med staff just a reminder, we are not healthcare professionals. We are just fans of true crime, talking about some of history's darkest moments in healthcare. Stay tuned, stay healthy, and stay safe. Healthcare Wars. Murder.